The following presentation is a production of Ride the Wave Media. Hello, witches and wizards. This is Courtney Pearl. You are listening to Practically Magic. I am your guide to discovering true and real magic in the world. I am a pagan witch. I am a card reader, healer, spiritualist, Celtic priestess, teacher, artist, and mystic seeker. And so today we are going to begin on the subject of raising magical children. So to start our episode, I do have one of my favorite Oracle decks that I use for kids when I'm doing events or um, my own kids when they want to do a reading. I use my first magic Oracle deck. Voila. And I'm going to pull a card for this episode. And this deck is really easy to use because it just already has a little uh, saying for each card. Kids can read it. Um, The pictures are magical and colorful and really fun. And it helps keep people, it helps kids get engaged into the, into the card reading itself. I'm shuffling. (laughs) So I'm not paying attention to what I'm saying. Okay. We are pulling a card that is the picture of an owl and it's kind of actually looking right directly at us in this card in the picture but it's winking one eye closed so I love that it's kind of cute um and I love that I pulled this card because currently as I'm recording this is the time of Lodiwith in the mythic moons of Avalon. And so during the time of Blodiwith in the year, um, Blodiwith is a Welsh story, Welsh folklore story about how um, she kind of does a bad thing, at least from one perspective of telling the story. And to be punished for it, she gets turned into an owl because it is said in the story that owls are the most hated of the birds. <laughs> That they're outcasts and that's why they only are awake at night because the other birds don't like them. Um, That's not really a lot of our relationship with owls, though. I think most people love owls. I think that they are excited when they see an owl. If you see one flying around in the daytime, it's kind of magical. You get a sense of, oh my gosh, there's an owl in the tree and I can see it and it's real. It's real life. It's not a cartoon. So I think that's a rebranding we've done of the owl. And the words on this card actually say, believe in the magic of life, which is absolutely perfect for our topic today, because we are going to talk about raising magical children. We're going to talk about children and magic. That is our theme today. I happen to have children of my own. And so this is going to be, I'm going to take you a little bit on my personal journey of how I came to the spirituality that I practice, but also in teaching it to my kids, in wanting to be an example for them in whatever spirituality that they seek, um, but also an empowerment for them. And uh, I also teach art lessons to kids. I have been a teacher for children for many years. That was a a previous life and career. I was an elementary school teacher. And I really love kids. I love hanging out with kids. I love being with kids. Um, As Cambria said in the episode that she was a guest on, I have a Leo moon sign, which means that I am really... I really kind of love engaging with kids in a playful way. I love being the center of attention. I love having dance parties or playing hide and go seek or, you know, the kinds of things that kids love to do. But I'm going to start off today with a story time. And I actually want to talk about an Irish mythology, an Irish legend of the children of Lear. So um, in a lot of Irish folklore, Lear is a god or a lord. Um, This is a sort of a living legend, which means that we aren't exactly sure of the exact origins of who Lear was other than what has been passed on orally. So I think that you can kind of, it's safe to say it's a, it's a living story. It's something that people have added to. You can even see in the story as I'm going to kind of paraphrase it, 
um, and I'm going to supply a link to the story so that you can read it in all of its glory um, on my blog. But you can kind of see where there was Christian influence in the mythology that before before that influence, it was a pagan mythology. It was a story of um, that had to do with the gods and goddesses. There was magic involved. And then there was some influence in the story as they talk about, you know, God being able to help them. But I am going to do my very best to tell this story. Now, some of the names of the places and the characters, I probably will completely mess up. So I apologize in advance if you are Irish, if you know these words and these places and you know that I am saying them incorrectly, just know in advance, I am doing my very best, having not lived in that region, and I will do my best to credit it to what it is. Okay. So in the story of the children of Lear, I'm told that this is a pretty, pretty well-known story in these parts of Ireland. Um, there was a king and um, Lear was meant to be king and he was passed up for, for his role as king. And so he was a little bit jealous of that. And so the king who, uh, is named Bold, I I believe King Bold offered Lear his daughter, pronounced Eve, um, as kind of a peace offering for their feud, and saying, "I'm sorry, I I'm going to be king, but I am going to give you my daughter as hand in marriage, and you can be the lord of your own lands." Now, Eve and Lear went on to have four children. They had a daughter and three sons. The last two are twins which I love about this story because I the last two of my kids are twins too. And I love when twins show up in mythology. There are a lot of mythology with twins. So his wife died after giving birth to his last ch children. And King Bod, uh offered another one of his daughters to so that he would be able to remarry. And the second daughter that he married, um, the sister to his first wife, was not necessarily a kind she was bitter and jealous as almost all the times we hear about stepmoms in mythology she was bitter that her the children received more love from lear as lear doted on them she took the place of their mother and their father and just um doted on his children more than his wife and she being a second wife did not like that so she decided she was going to do away with these children. And when it came time to actually kill the children, she couldn't do it. So she decided that she would just use magic. She happened to have a knowledge of magic, which in all of the best, best fairy tales and mythology, it's both the evil stepmother and a witch all rolled into one role. So love that for her. She's taking the children out to a lake and she decides to encourage them to go swimming. And as they get into the lake to go swimming, the North Channel, um, the names and places in this mythology, I love just like in the Welsh mythology, they are actual places. So people who live in these lands, they're connected to these stories. They can visit these lakes and they can talk about the children of Lear being in this lake. So the children go for a swim and she uses a magic spell to turn them into swans. So there's four children now swans, but they had re remained able to speak and they had their dignity and their knowledge. They just had their physical appearance turn into swans. And the stepmother left them there at the lake and cursed them that they must stay there at this lake or these particular bodies of water for 300 years and they could not return home. And of course, when she got back, Lear noticed that she came back without the children. He was very upset and he told on her to her dad and he told King Bod that his new wife, uh, his daughter, the king's daughter had, um, done something to his children and she was punished she was um turned into the shape of a demon of the air 
I'm not exactly sure what that means. Maybe he turned into a bat. I don't know. I'm just kind of picturing something like that. Um, so there she remains. And that was her state she was left in. And Lear, going back to look for his children, could hear his children's voices singing at the lake. But all he could see were the swans, four swans swimming in the lake. And so 300 years came and went. They were still swans. And in the story, they move from bodies of water. Um, there's kind of some changing of they go to the streets of Moyle uh, and they anyway, they have to spend 300 years in each of these places. And so it ends up being 900 years before they're finally able to return home. And apparently they're still swans. They get to go home being swans, but when they get home, they realize that it's completely abandoned and nothing but ruins left because now they've spent nearly a thousand years being swans. And finally they were able to find an enchant. Uh, um, in this case, the story changes a little bit to where they pray to God and God blesses them and with their belief in God. So this is where there may be some Christian influence into the mythology where it says that a monk was able, in some versions, it's actually St. Patrick himself. I love that. Um, don't we love St. Patrick for all of his work <laughs> in driving out the pagans? But anyway, he was able to transform them back into humans. But at this point, they are not children anymore. They are old. So when they are transformed into humans, it's an old woman and three old men. And um, they asked just that they be baptized before they die. And again, there's that Christian influence into the story, but they are they are able to be baptized before they die. And then this is the end of their story. That is their fate to be swans for 900 years and then to finally become human again right before they die. So I am telling this story because we are going to talk a little bit about children today and the raising of children into a magical sort of um, upbringing and how how that works. Because I did have a, a question from a listener a couple of episodes ago, if you go back um, where I invite people to write in questions, things that they might want to ask. And I love to engage with the audience on things like that. And I had somebody reach out to me and say, um, you know, talk about whether or not these practices that you're teaching or talking about, or, you know, anything that we talk about in our subjects, um, if it's appropriate for children. And I have a lot to say about that. And there is kind of a school of thought, like if you were going to dabble into certain practices of witchcraft, or if you were going to dabble in certain practices of paganism, um, there is such a thing called sex magic. And um, there is things that are just for adults. But as I am telling this story, I want it to be very clear that this is not just indoctrinating children into witchcraft. This is about teaching children the ways of empowering themselves to believe in magic. And truth be told, children do not need a lot of convincing that magic is real, okay? Because they come out of the womb and being raised really believing in magic, understanding magic, understanding energy better than us adults. We're the ones who have been sort of indoctrinated or trained out of thinking that that could be real, that there is such a thing as magic or there is such a thing as energy in the universe or unseen forces. And it takes quite a bit of convincing to to um, let adults know that there is that magic in the world that they can access, that they can that they can be empowered by. Um, children already believe in it. So let's just say this is your letter to Hogwarts. You are, um, you have been found <laughs> to be a magical person. We, the Council of Magical People, have dubbed you worthy. That perhaps you are not the muggle you thought you were. And sometimes I hear people use the term muggle when they mean people who just really don't believe in this kind of stuff. When they're just, they don't speak the language. It seems really foreign to them. Um, it almost makes them uncomfortable to talk about or think about. And that's okay. That's not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with you if this is just kind of not your thing. But we can refer to those people as muggles because they just are existing in their life in a different 
realm than we are. We're existing in a realm that does participate in magical things. And that can be even the most superstitious rituals that you have. It doesn't really matter. But I am going to... start off by telling you a little bit about my story. So I was raised, give or take, loosely in the Mormon tradition and in a Christian fundamentalist Mormon tradition. Um, And I say loosely because my particular family was not what you would call the true believers, I guess, in that my parents were raised in traditional Mormon families. Um, I am a descendant of the Mormon pioneers. Um, I'm sure if I go back in my family history, I would find exactly the person who was converted and they were probably converted to Mormonism um, directly from someone who knew Joseph Smith. So if you know the church history at all, um, and it is a fairly new Christian church. I mean, we act like Mormonism is really kind of taking over the planet, but that's because we live here in Utah. And so that's kind of my own, um, you know, just where I come from religion. And um, I think that there was a deep sense of growing up like, okay, I don't really have to subscribe to everything in this doctrine. I just, I'm just exposed to it. This is what I'm exposed to. So following in the footsteps of my more recent ancestors and my pioneer ancestors, I was just doing what was expected of me at that time. So I know that early on, I was kind of a, we use the term Jack Mormon around here. Like it's like you kind of like pick and choose what it is you're going to do and what you're going to participate in. I never saw anything wrong with that. It was just kind of like, you know, religion and spirituality is personal to everyone. And now looking back on it, um, kind of looking at even I have lots of family still very much devoted members of the church and friends and um, people I really care about and love and respect. And so I want to just point out that I really do understand what that means to them and that I understand the value of participating in that kind of an institution. So for me, I stayed longer going to church as an adult probably because of those reasons, not because of my belief or testimony in it, but because I was very much comforted by the um, the certainty of it all, especially when it came to what am I going to pass on to my own children? So knowing that my parents weren't really true believers, but that they felt like this was important to pass on to me, Um, and my sister and say, you know, I don't know what you want to take from this, but here it is anyway. And I think that was a really good way to go about it because it left my mind open. It left me willing to learn what I needed to learn from it and from other things. So I know I stayed going to church, um, quite a long time into my adulthood. And even when my first son was born, we were going because I liked the structure and our brains are wired to like certainty. It's where we get our dopamine. So we like the certainty. We're being told exactly what is the blueprint for life and what we're doing. Um, and I liked <laughs> if the Mormon church is anything It is definitely organized. (laughs) They have a very strict, um, they program, they have a strict program where it's manuals, teaching manuals. Um, they come out with new ones every year and every four years, it's a different, um, they rotate through the doc, the doctrine. So they might spend an entire year focused on the new Testament of the Bible and the old Testament, and then the book of Mormon, and then the doctrine and covenants, and they have their doctrines that they teach. And it's very structured. It's very well structured because they can send those same manuals out to every church in the world and everybody's doing the same thing. Everyone's getting the same lessons and they're broken down weekly throughout the whole year. So the teacher in me clearly loved that. I love a schedule. I love a lesson plan. I love to take the bones of something and then be creative with it. Um, I feel like I'm more creative and more inspired when I have some 
structure to follow, some collaboration with that. And so, yeah, I I thought, you know, even if I don't teach it exactly the way that they are putting it out there, um, I thought for a long time that I would be continuing to teach the come follow me lessons. So they send out this booklet that is like, you know, here's your lessons for your kids at home. Here's what you're going to follow. <laughs> and I, I kind of thought that I was going to do that. Um, I think that I, there was a kind of a shift at some point where I realized, and maybe I was getting some influence from other people who had done this before me, who said, you don't need the church and its doctrine to be spiritual and to teach your kids. It is something that maybe will take a little bit of work on your part um, to structure something, but you can, you can do whatever it is you want with your kids and your family, and it doesn't have to follow suit with an organization. And once I kind of got brave enough to try that, um, I did get myself a binder with 12 tabs. So there would be a 12 different themes, 12 months of the year. Um, and this was the beginning of my kind of trying to piece together, how am I going to do this? And I started with stories. I have young children. And even if I didn't have young children, I myself personally love stories. I love what stories have to teach us. I think stories, whether told in movies, um, written down in books, uh, or even on your Instagram reel, I feel like stories are a powerful, powerful connection we can make to each other. Um, it's like having living art. You know, there's an art piece that you might connect with because it has the colors and the emotion that you're, you know, you're vibing with, but stories kind of make that come alive to me with characters, with events, with things that happen. And I've always been like that. I think it comes from my grandma, my mom's mom, who was a storyteller. Now, she was very much devoted to the Mormon church, but she also loved stories. She had a, she had at least one, maybe several binders full of stories. She loved to put on little puppet shows. She loved to do little skits at Christmas time. She loved to gather us around or to put us um, to bed at night when we were visiting her house. And I remember distinctly how she told the story of Beauty and the Beast to me um, in the most original form that it was first published in. So um, I think in the original form, he had the head of a beast, but the body of a man or something like that. So it was very creepy when she told the story. But I remember her telling us the story of Beauty and the Beast before the Disney movie came out. Yes, I know I'm old. You don't have to point it out. I get it. But it was before Disney put out the movie Beauty and the Beast, the animated Beauty and the Beast. And she told us that story of bedtime. And I mean, if you don't believe in magic, the moments that I spent with her connecting to those stories and making the images up in my head as she told it to me and as I fell asleep, that's a pretty magical moment and will always, always bond me to my grandmother, no matter what our religious beliefs are, no matter, no matter what. So telling stories has been a traditional way to teach children life and magic and power and morals and values since the dawn of time in um, almost every culture across the world. So that's where I started. I started with stories. I started collecting stories and I would put them into whatever tab of the binder I thought they might fit in. So when that month came up, I could tell those stories and then create some kind of activity to go with it. Cause that's the teacher in me. I have to, you know, there has to be a follow-up or something, something engaging. Now I will say that this doesn't solve the problem um, of trying to take, you know, what I wanted to pass on to my children as far as something to guide their lives. Um, to teach them something about magic. Uh, I will say that it has been a long journey. <laughs> we started this a few years ago. My kids, my youngest are five and my um, oldest is nine. And I still 
we call it Sunday story times. So I'm trying to kind of follow the traditional structure of Sundays being sacred or family time or, you know, church or whatever. We usually do something outdoors in nature. I try to do something like a meditation or gardening or something that gets us out into the sunshine or into the earth, um, connecting with the land, connecting with our own personal plot of land that we currently reside or even the mountains that surround us. And um, to tell you the truth, I, I still say to my kids on Sundays, okay, guys, after breakfast, we're going to do our Sunday story time or, hey, I'm going to turn on the fire and we're going to go snuggle up in a blanket. And this is what I'm picturing that it's going to happen. This is how I think it's going to go. My kids are just going to love snuggling up with pillows and blankets next to the fireplace, the hearth of our of our family home, or even outdoors in the near the bonfire or around, you know, whatever we're doing. And they'll just be so excited to hear another Sunday story time, a new story every week or whatever. This is how I picture it's going to go. And I can tell you right off the bat, it absolutely 100% has never gone like that. <laughs> and I am telling you this because if anyone is looking to seek something that they can do with their kids that is maybe they're transitioning out of a traditional church environment and they want something that still engages in community, um, that still holds the structure that they're used to, this is what I attempted to do and I'm still attempting to do. I still think it's worth the effort. I think it's worth a try to create those memories. And I think sometimes moms end up being the lore keepers and the spiritual holders of the family. Um, I hope that's not the case always and in every situation, but it does tend to fall on us women and mothers to offer that to our children. So here I have really had moments where I am kind of wondering, okay, how much do I make my children sit down and listen to a story? And is that just like doing the exact same thing that church was doing for them, which is like, you have to listen to this and you have to do it and you have to participate in it or like let go of that altogether and just be like, Hey, you, you, if you want to do a story, I'm here to do a story, but we don't have to. And in that case, we may never. I'm not really sure the right answer there. I am still figuring that out because I feel like if I didn't kind of push or almost force my children to sit down and listen to a story, even for a few minutes, it would never happen. And how did our indigenous ancestors, how did they carry traditions on to the next generation if they didn't maybe kind of force their kids to sit down and listen to the stories? Now, I imagine that children of a different generation in the past, um, you know, go back a few hundred years, they probably didn't have to be forced because they didn't have other things to do. They didn't have screens. They didn't have, you know, parks with a playground and all the toys and all the things that distract kids today, you know, wanting to go do those things. Because honestly, they do sound all a lot more fun than sitting down and listening to a story your mom has to tell you. I get it, which is why I've kind of, you know, tried to create like no screen days. No, Sunday is going to be a no screen day. None of us, even mom and dad, are going to be not on our phones. We're not turning on the TV. We're not playing video games. We're not doing any of that. And so if you want to be entertained, it's going to be with a story. And perhaps that will be encouraging to them. But I collected stories from everywhere and everything. I collected stories. I have um, mindfulness for kids, little cards and activities that um, are kind of from a Buddhist practice of mindfulness. And I have Buddhism for kids. And I collected stories from Hindu. Um, some of them are Chinese folk stories. Um, I have a list of children's stories that I will provide on my blog. So for those of you who are like, where do I even begin? How do I collect stories? How do I collect things that have a moral to them? Um, I collected a bunch of different kid-friendly stories that are beautiful with beautiful pictures, something that would be more engaging and encouraging for them to come and sit with me. 
Um, Dawn Casey has one called Winter Tales. Um, one of my favorites is Angela McAllister has written a bunch of books for kids that um, are kind of follow along the year. So um, I picked up a year full of stories, 52 folk tales and legends from around the world. So I will post a link to that. And I just started collecting as many things as I could. And even if I just made notes in my binder of where I was going to put those tabs and where in the year we were going to talk about those things, um, I need to revamp that completely. Because even as I started that a couple of years ago, I didn't know where to begin with any of that. I thought, okay, how do I even pick what themes should be each month? <laughs> and I'm going to be honest, <laughs> and this is completely crazy and silly, and I'm almost embarrassed to admit it, but I picked the young women value theme from when I was a young woman. Um, young women's is a program in the Mormon church where girls from age 12 to 18 are in the young women's program. Back when I was that age and doing it, they actually had a little um, personal progress booklet that you were working on to earn your medallion or whatever it was kind of like there was their um solution to boy scouts for girls like they were like what can the church have for girls to do that would increase their spirituality and connect them with getting getting ready to be a endowed member of the church to be married in the temple to be a mother you know all of the things that we're prepping girls for to um to be the free domestic labor of the church. Okay, so that's a topic for another day about feminism. But in Young Women's, we had a theme. If this doesn't sound cult like, I don't know what does, but we had a theme we were meant to recite. At every meeting and church activity, we had to stand up and say, We are daughters of our Heavenly Father who loves us and we love Him. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I used to have it all memorized. And there was a list of themes um, that we value so faith divine nature individual worth and on and on and it goes and so i thought those were pretty good place to start so i named each tab after one of the the things the themes of the young women theme so it was january was faith february was divine nature so those would be the focuses or topics of the stories or the lessons or anything else that i had to offer my children and we would do sunday story times we would just do kind of like church at home and it would be a program that i get to create and i get to build from the from the bottom up and um I also really loved getting inspiration on things to teach them about uh, from like podcasts like this secular Buddhism, um, which I loved because it was just fundamental, basic things about life that help us live our lives. And when I began to shift more into a pagan, magical mindset, I realized that it didn't matter if we call ourselves pagan or if we call it witchcraft, because this spirituality is really about empowering each individual to have and believe in the magic that they have within themselves. So in the episode, um, two episodes back, if you listen to the episode we had on intuition, where Rachel Cox Taylor and I talk about our role as healers is not actually to heal anyone, but to help them understand their journey in healing, in witnessing themselves, in, in engaging with their own intuition. And I feel like that is a fantastic thing to impart to my children and to any children that need to follow their own, their own worth, their own discovery. So whether I'm teaching my kids or whether I'm teaching my art students and my art lessons are not just art lessons. Um, my art lessons are very much about teaching kids to be empowered through art that through the experience of creation, creating art, we can discover how we show up every day for everyday activities. Do we show up scared? Do we show up worried we aren't doing it right? And for me, 
being able to tap into what the spirituality of discovering your true self, the higher self, the love, the unconditional love that Rachel talked about is to help my children and other children to tap into that because they already have it. I mean, I don't know if you've ever met a two-year-old, but two-year-olds don't have to be convinced to love themselves. Two-year-olds and three-year-olds are kind of showing up in the world, at least if they haven't already been traumatized and abused, and that's a whole other thing. But for the most part, children come into the world feeling very confident and very sure of themselves. And they also create things like art with absolutely no worry whatsoever of what anyone else thinks about it because it's not about that. They create art simply and purely because it is fun to do, because it's magical. And you know why it's magical? Because they had an idea in their head and then they made that idea happen on paper into the physical world. And if that's not magic, I don't know what is. I have an idea in my mind and then I'm putting it out there into the physical world. And that is quite simply what magic is. So go back to my very first episode. What is magic? Because when I am teaching children anything about magic, I'm not teaching them to be witches. I'm not teaching them to be, you know, pagan even. Although I do think everybody's pagan. So that's a whole thing. But I teach children to honor the God within themselves. The God isn't sought out by some other person telling you what is right and wrong. And truly, when you get really deep into it, when you really start getting um, into the theology of it all or the philosophy of it, I even start to pick away at the words right and wrong. Because when I learned that the like original meaning of the texts in the Bible of the word sin, the word sin didn't ever mean a bad thing you do. In the original translation of the of the um, Aramaic uh, in the texts, they talk about how the word when the word sin would come up, it actually meant um, a disengage from yourself. That when you sin, it just means that you are detached from your true self and participating in something over off the path. So repentance is not like an apology and a, and a, a you know, flaying yourself and shaming yourself for what you did wrong. Um, repentance meant return to self. So a repentance process should just look like coming back to who the true self is. And the true self is the calm, confident, curious, connected self. So when we do the work of, of returning to self, we're repenting. That is it. And we can say that sinning is something we do every day, all day long. Anytime we let the ego run away with itself, which every person listening right now is guilty of in this very day you're listening to this. In the moment you're hearing this, you can think of a moment today that you let your ego run away, right? Where you got really frustrated and angry at somebody or you were rushed, you felt rushed. I'm, I'm, there's not enough time. Um, there's not enough money. There's not enough. Um, anytime that you have come away from yourself, you're engaging with judgment, you're engaging with um, annoyance, frustration, anger, um, you know, any of those things. And that's not bad. That's not a, even, you know, a sin in the way that we usually think of sin. It's not a bad thing to have that happen. That's human. That's just your human part. So when I teach children to be magical, I go back to the principles that I talked about in the very first episode where I say, all of us are magical and all of us are writing spells, whether we know it or not. 
Now, the best kind of spells are the ones that we put intention into, that we are intending on being for a certain thing. Um, So when we say a prayer, when we ask for something, when we make an offering, when we engage with elements in that ritual or in that spell, that is only amplifying the intention that we're setting for it. And writing spells, quite simply, just down to the very, very basics of it, is telling stories. You are using your words and thoughts and feelings to tell a story. And whether you know it or not, whether it's conscious or not, the subconscious is constantly telling stories, constantly, all day long, telling stories. We need to be very careful and be very aware and mindful of what are those stories. What stories are you telling? And I love using art to kind of be a a facilitator of this idea. Because when someone approaches a canvas or piece of paper, are you approaching it with the story of, I can't do it. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not good at this. I don't know how to do it. I'm a terrible artist. It's going to look terrible. Or as you're creating it, oh, this looks terrible. This is awful. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, I made a mistake. Oh, I should start over. Are you approaching the process of creation with the story that you are not good enough? Or are you engaging with the process of creation, whether it's art or life in general, are you approaching it with a thought of, I'm a magical being. I can make anything that I think or feel into reality. And whatever comes out of it, is what's meant to be. And I will make it into something amazing no matter what. And I am also going to engage with it with enthusiasm. Someone once told me enthusiasm is like the feeling of God. Like it's the energy of God. So if you have something uh, that you are participating in with enthusiasm, you're actually enjoying it The creative process is not frustrating and annoying and a chore. The creative process is fun and creative and magical. Imagine the difference that you can make in what you actually make happen. Okay, so I want to invite you to... If you have children or if you work with children in any capacity in your life, even if you are um, a traditionally, I use the word traditionally, but it's actually not as traditional. That's not even like a good word to use because when you say traditional, we should be talking about indigenous people's practices of all over the world. The pagan practices are the traditional practices. But if you were to engage with the sort of um, fundamental religious practices, you were somebody who does go to church and does subscribe to that doctrine. None of what I have said today discludes you. You can engage with magic. And a lot of my own students, my art students um, are Mormon or who are, you know, Christian who go to church and um, believe in that spiritual practice. It doesn't matter because the magic I am teaching kids to engage with is the magic of the world. And imagine how empowering that is, that as a child reaches the age of nine years old, they start to decide what is success and what is failure. They start to look at things as I'm really good at this or I'm not really good at this. But what if we could raise children who were confident enough to know that I can actually make anything happen and I can make anything work? Um, Even if something goes differently than I thought it was going to, I am a magical being who can make this happen. I can connect with that creative source, creative source of the universe and make this happen for me. Can you imagine if you could go back to yourself at an earlier age and talk to yourself and say, don't think that you're not good at this. The thinking you're not good at this is going to stop you from becoming good at this. Imagine all of the advice you'd give yourself at a younger age. And by the way, if you ever want to do that, If you ever want to go back in time and actually talk to your former child self, that is what an IPT emotional process does. 
And that is what I facilitate. So if you feel that that would help you in getting unstuck from some of these patterns of the stories you're telling yourself, come find me. We'll work on that together. All right, witches and wizards, we're going to close this up. I, this was a, an, an interesting uh, topic to bring forward for parents and teachers and hopefully a little helpful. And I wanted to inspire you, even if you don't have children, to reparent yourself in that way of, I don't actually need anybody to tell me the structure of what creates my life. I get to be the creator of my life. And I'm a magical being who can do that. So join me next week. The topic for next week's episode is going to be witch burning. We're going to talk about the stories of the stories and history of burning witches and the who done it. So, witch burning, who done it? A um, couple of events I want to talk about that's coming up before we leave today. I have a tarot for tips event that I do with my friend Ben, the Fresh King Benjamin. If you know him, he's a local comedian and he has um, a great daybreak following and he's a really funny, fun guy, but he also reads cards. So we read cards together sometimes and we are going to be at Ground to Earth Coffee Shop on Soda Row in Daybreak. That's on Kestrel Rise. And it's this adorable, cute little coffee shop. Not a lot of space, but I think we'll be fine. We're going to tuck ourselves into a little corner or we might be outside on the patio. It's going to be a beautiful day on May 19th. We're going to be there from 10 to 12. And uh, you can grab yourself a beverage, a coffee. They have the most delicious fruit infused lemonades. I always get those in the summer. And they have invited us to come and do a tarot for tips. So that means we're just going to be there with our table and with our cards. And anybody who wants to walk by and get their cards read, it is just for tips. So you can pay as you like. Whatever you feel like tipping is going to be an investment in your reading. So I want to invite you to come and find us there. Come and see us. Come check us out. Just come say hi. And if you're a listener of the podcast, let me know because I might have some a little something for you. Um, the n other events I have coming up, really fun, are on May 17th on a Friday is my Heart Smart Art. So as we've been talking today in today's episode about magic and children, this is an emotional intelligence workshop that I do with parents and children. And I do this at Biscott's Cafe in Daybreak. So the last few events that we've done have been so fun. We get out, we do a breathing, we do a um, some chanting and drumming, which is just, you know, kind of singing songs and having fun. Um, the next workshop that I'm going to be doing with the, with the kids, this is age five to 12 and their parents, we are going to be doing another focus on anger. So we're going to be talking about anger. We're going to be talking about heavy feelings and we're going to do an art project of painting rocks. Every child is going to go home with a little scribble spot mini book. So please look out for that. It's on May 17th at 2 p.m. And May 30th coming up at the end of the month is my next Healing Through Art workshop. This is a fantastic workshop. I'm so proud of. It is actually the IPT emotional process. I do one-on-one, -on -one, but I've adapted it into a group session. So I've been doing this for over a year now. Every month I offer this workshop. It's not for artists. Anyone can do it. It just happens to include painting in the healing process and using the shapes and colors to paint out the heavy feelings that we have trapped in our body. It starts with a guided meditation, drumming. It's a relaxing evening. It's fantastic to do with family members or as a couple for date night. Please sign up on my website. And for that, you can look for links to my website on my Instagram at prism underscore healing. You can find me on Facebook, Courtney Pearl or Courtney Pearl's Prism Healing. And you can also find me on my website, which is www.prism-healing.com for all of my events, 
all of my events, all of my services are listed there on my website. Anything that I do that you'd like to um, sign up for a session with me, I do card reading sessions. I do 10 point priority wellness plan sessions. I do emotional process and I do Reiki sessions. So if you are looking for any type of healing, if you feel stuck, if you feel like your ego is run away, if you feel sinful and you need to repent, please come and see me for an emotional process and for some healing work. So look for my website. And at the top of my website, there is a little link or little tab that says blog. If you've enjoyed this episode or any of the previous episodes of Practically Magic, I offer a blog post for each episode. It is not a script of the episode. It is its own separate thing. But for the episode, I write some additional information or links or any of the resources that I've listed today on the children's books that I use with my kids in helping raise magical children, I am going to put all of that on the blog post. So please look that up on my website. And I will list everything that I personally have in my library for you and links to anything else that I've happened to come across. So I would like to thank Ride the Wave Media, Jess Blaine, and their podcast network producing this podcast episode and all of the great work that they do to put out content like this. Um, I would like to thank Sarah Elbert at Daybreak Treasures Boutique. She features me as an artist on her boutique and sells my work for me. And um, she's also one of my best friends. So I want to give a shout out to her and go look up her website if you want to see mine and other local artists. And I would like to give another shout, shout out to all my Daybreak people, Daybreak business community and the residents and all of the people who live in the Daybreak community. You are the best. I love you. You have welcomed me and made me a part of your community. And I get to self-title myself the Daybreak witch. Daybreak's own personal witch. Come to me for your spells and curses. And I want you to go make magic, witches and wizards. So go out there, make some magic today.